Well, good afternoon, Waterloo. It is a pleasure to be here. My name's Rob. I, um, I heard about this course being on anatomy, so I, I, I bought some scrubs and got the rubber gloves. Hate germs. But apparently, application anatomy has nothing to do with that. So now I feel silly. It is fantastic to be here in Waterloo at the home of Blackberry. I'm going to ask you a quick question before we start. How many people here have a car? How many people here drive a standard? So that was more than half. OK, that's actually important. Now hopefully, everyone is tweeting during the day. Cool graphic here shows people whispering. What happens when you whisper? A room full of people whispering creates a buzz. And the whole point of these BlackBerry Jam events is to get out the buzz about BlackBerry 10. OK, so here's the session agenda. I'm going to go through a platform overview. Aspects of it are going to be similar to what you've already seen. I'm going to go over some application guidelines from a more developer-centric point of view. Talk about application packaging, because these are steps you're going to have to know to build and to package your BlackBerry 10 app. Monetizing, because pretty much everyone is here to make money. OK, sure, there might be some hobbyists, general interest people. But if you are going to try and sell your own app as yourself, then you care about monetization. If you are working for someone building an enterprise app for BlackBerry 10, then they're paying you, so you're getting money anyway. And then quick aspects on publishing. Shadid will be following up in the next two sessions with building Cascades app from start to finish. And I'm going to finish off in the fourth session with some tooling. So let's jump into the platform overview. Why native? Because it's portable. I have spoken to lots of Java developers that say C isn't portable, C++ isn't portable. What's Java? the interpreter written in? What's Linux written in? What's QNX written in? C is the ultimate importability. C++ extends under that. It is powerful. Java, using that as an example again, it has JSR extensions for OpenGL wrappers. But you've still got to be interpreted by Java before you can pass that OpenGL call down to the drivers. It's just a tiny bit slower. And it can be delightful. One aspect where a native interface can become delightful is when it updates so fast that there is no jitter. There is no lag. In the real world, when you pick something up, throw it around, it moves in real time. You never pick it up, your hand's here, then the object follows you, then you throw it, and uh, it's uh, still over here. That doesn't happen. For an interface to be delightful, it has to be responsive. It has to be fast. It has to be fluid. Now, we already saw that there were a big bunch of SDKs to choose from. I'm going to go from right to left. And I'd like people in the crowd to raise their hand if you are good at, or regularly in the last, I don't know, three years, have used this language. Who here is a Java developer? Yeah, a lot of the room. For a very long time, Java was my day-to-day -day job, developing. Who is a Flash or Air developer? Healthy population, too. Who can get on with the HTML and the JavaScript? Who can make that happen? Who in here, oh, that, that's actually really good, because we already saw that the QML, it wraps up JavaScript. So having that skill is handy. And who is? very fluent in C or C++. Good stuff. Now, this one might be a trick question. Who's fluent in Cascades already? OK, we've got a couple of good people. Now, everything that we're going to look at here, to a degree, you can already do. Because right now, you can go to developerblackberry.com, and you can download our SDKs. You can look at all our documentation. You can download the simulator. Because if you don't have a dev alpha, 
you can still simulate it. So we've gone through the effort of building a VM-based simulator, not like the Java simulator of yore, but a VM-based simulator so that you can run your app, real QNX, running on x86 in real time. So let's get into some application guidelines. One thing with the look and feel of the platform, if everything looks similar, works similar, acts like you expect it, every user has a better impression of the platform because things look right. Things work right. Now, the device is full touch for the first ones. We did announce recently the screen sizes of the keyboard-based phones. But for the first one, it's full touch. And it's mostly portrait. It's mostly portrait because it's easier to hold that way. Like, if I want to view it, it doesn't feel as comfortable. When you hold a portrait, that's when it feels better. And it's also going to be, ideally, mostly one-handed. Because it's used to talk. It's used when you're running. And that leads me to a question. You saw in the previews before that the navigation buttons are down the bottom. Yeah? So when you are holding a phone, does this look more natural or does this look more natural? <laughs> so if you've got your navigation buttons way up the top, uh, you must have very long fingers. And I've got fairly big hands. And no, no, it's not happening. OK, the tall device. Yeah, 16 by 9, so the screen is tall. When you first view a book, say you're using the Kobo app on Playbook, same aspect ratio, it looks really tall when you go to portrait. So you've got to think about that when you're designing your app. Like I just mentioned, make those daily interactions reachable by one hand. Now, that's not saying you can't make any complex app you want where you need two hands. Just for daily stuff, for fluid stuff, for the communication and the flow, try and do it with one hand. Now, oh, I already said that bit. Okay, let's skip to the next slide. Content is king. We've already heard that a few times today. I'd like to talk about it a bit. This here is Oscar Pretorius. He is an Olympian. How many Olympians are there in the room? I thought so. Unfortunately, not everyone can be that fast. Now, how he's related to content is king is he has, always with him when he's running, an interface between his human body and mechanics. How much does he think about the interface when he is being an Olympic, able-bodied, capable athlete? Never. I hope. Hopefully it's not. It could be hurting. I don't know. But ideally, you never think about the interface. So if on your device you have a picture you just took, of your daughter, and you think, oh, it'd be nice if grandma could see that. That's the ideal interface, just thinking it. We've always got to add something. What is the number one selling transmission type in Canada? Yeah, it's automatic. But a room full of developers mostly drives standard. What does that say about what you guys think about user interfaces? Yeah. The manual, the standard, it gives you control. You can go, mmm, 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 make the wheel spin super easy. I love it. My car doesn't get the gas mileage that it said it would when I bought it, but I love that control. But for day-to-day -day use, do I need that control? For day-to-day -day use, when I'm sitting in traffic on the highway, because I work in the Mississauga office, do I need to have a manual as I'm edging forward, burning out my clutch? No, but it's still fun because I care about the interface. In day-to-day -day tasks, do users care about the interface or do they care that it's easy? You guys have got to think about every piece of Chrome you put on that page because you're hiding that picture of the daughter. You're making it harder to run. It's nice to have rich features, but you don't have to have them always instantly accessible on the front screen. It's a cinematic experience. The screens are delightful. 
they have such vibrant colors, great contrasts, and when you start using gestures, it's almost theatrical because you bring things across. You are involved. You are the actor. This is your stage. This is your cinema. You're controlling it. So the bigger and more powerful you make those user interfaces and the more you interact with gestures, the better the user experience is going to be. And it's great to have a fluid workflow. That actually wasn't a joke, but that is kind of the perfect slide for that to happen. <laughs> Press the button, nothing happens. A fluid workflow, if you can, take that image of the daughter and just flick and share it. <laughs> if you can just flick and share it with grandma, get it out of the way, get it done, grandma's happy, you're happy, and you can continue your day. You've enjoyed the device, but you haven't spent a lot of time using the device. You haven't spent time looking for things. That fluid workflow makes everything delightful. Now, BlackBerry 10 is <laughs> different than the rest. That is a fashion designer. His name is Karl Lagerfeld. And he has a quote there. He, Carl, I like to reinvent myself. It's part of my job. Uh, hang on, just have to check my notes. Uh, apparently, wearing aluminum foil for a jacket is unusual. So, okay. In the field of fashion, reinventing yourself keeps you alive. It keeps you current. You can't be wearing suspenders and pants with no Ds on them because that's what was cool in the 1840s. You have to keep current. You have to reinvent yourself. You have to adapt to the times. And that's what BlackBerry 10 is about, reinvention. To make a great app and to sell a great Ah, dear. To make a great app, to sell a great app, you need to understand the platform. You also need to be aware how important user comments are. So look at these two sample comments for a fictitious GPS app. The app is fluid and smooth. It has a great integration with the camera. I would recommend this to anyone. Five stars. Competing app says the GPS data didn't work. The app crashed. I wasted five bucks. Stay away. Which one would you buy? Anyone? I would buy the one on, yes, the left. Yes, the left. I would buy the one on the left. Most people would. So you've got to make sure that you understand the platform and know how to react. If someone has turned off their GPS, of course, they want to save power. If someone has gone indoors, they don't have a GPS right now, and your app fails to run because it can't get a GPS signal, that could be frustrating. If someone is trying to plan a trip using your mapping app, and there's no way that they can search near somewhere else, tell the phone that you are somewhere else, I don't want to find gas stations near here, and you've made that difficult to use. You've made that frustrating for people. And it's not going to rate as highly. Every service like that, like GPS, the accelerometers, all of those, they can be denied by the user. So if your app doesn't need the accelerometer to run properly, should you continue to execute when they didn't give you permission to access the accelerometer? Yeah. But not everyone does that. It's really frustrating. Something else you really have to think about on BlackBerry 10 is the application lifecycle behavior. If you don't respond correctly to these events, you can make the phone behave badly. You can make people frustrated. So here's a little state diagram. From start, you're given up to normal, to active. And then you can become a thumbnail, and you can be active or inactive, or you can be hidden, inactive, or you can be exited. The difference between these states is really important to understand. If you have a game, and you're playing, and you're very excited, you're up to a great level, suddenly a phone vibrates, you've got a new email, you want to peek, 
Oh, it's from Grandma. She got the photo. You go all the way across. You say, yeah, she is cute. Respond. Come back to your game. Your character has been murdered 72 times because the game didn't go into the background. Little things like that. You have to get it right to get a proper experience. You're also going to save battery because if you're sitting there animating all those characters, <laughs> that's not good. Something that's on BB10 that's very different to BlackBerry 7 and before is the application sandbox. You now have a dedicated space on the hard drive just for your app. So when you install your app, you see in there a directory called data. Underneath data is where you should be storing data that's relevant for your app. When an upgrade of your app is installed, the data directory is not blown away. So you have to expect that it'll still be there. You have to make sure you've put in the effort to be able to read your old formats. If you can't read version 1.0 of your database, when you run that app, it's going to crash. People are going to have a bad experience. You're going to get a bad rating. And that's pretty sad. So make sure you expect it to be there. Spend that effort. Make sure you can read your old files. Logs. Ah, this is for putting logs in. Um, now, that's important because just under that is user shared. So from the file browser, you can see user shared. So on my playbook, I've opened up screens in the file browser, and I've seen 2,052 short text files that were finger coordinates on the screen. Because someone wrote logs to use a shared. That's bad. That's just going to be a horrible experience for the user. And OK, it's easier for you to retrieve them, but that's not the right way to do it. A temp directory as well, so that you can store temporary stuff that you can't guarantee will be there next time the device is rebooted. Uh, I already mentioned app. This is where your content is. Your assets will be in there, and they'll be read-only. So if you have bundled 27 images with your, with your code and a couple of libraries, that's where they're going to be. So you can open those inside your app anytime you want. Shared, I already mentioned. Now, application interaction, you have to leverage the platform. You want to integrate with the OS and the other applications that are there. And that's where you would use the invocation APIs. So in BBM, you've just received a doc file. BBM wants to open this doc file. That's where the invocation framework comes in. Some application can open doc files. user's happy. If you have a couple of applications that can open doc files, you get to see a choice. But if you had your application built, and it is the best doc file viewer, doc file editor, it's totally Word 2014 compatible, but you don't register as an invocation target, when someone receives that doc file in BBM and they say open, they're not going to see your app. They've got it installed. They kind of remember buying it six months ago. But they're not going to open it. So if you integrate properly with the platform, that stuff will be there. There's lots of stuff in there you can extend. With the BBM framework, you can be sending messages, getting involved with your BBM contacts. They can know what they're doing, know what you're up to, share things as part of BBM. Using the share framework, you can send stuff, like I mentioned this photo, to Facebook and tweet it. Why not? You could write an app that easily did a multi-share. As the share target, you called yourself the share all app. And inside of that, you could share it with everybody. Send it to Facebook, send it to Twitter, send it to MySpace. <laughs> hey. Mail and PIM APIs. BlackBerry has that DNA, that heritage of receiving email, managing your contacts, managing that personal information. Managing, no, it's PIM, personal information management. It's there. Integrate with it in your app, 
is more fluid. It fits the whole experience of BB10. And universal search, your app has assets. If they can be searched for, again, users are going to be happy. And you've enhanced the platform. Device independence is also really important. Outside before lunch, I was showing some demos where the playbook code ran perfectly on the dev alpha. Of course, people had thought ahead. They hadn't worried about screen sizes. They had adapted. If you are hard coding to a 720 by 720 pixel screen, your app's not going to look very good when someone runs it on a 1280 by 720. So you've got to think ahead. You've got to make sure that you can support those devices. The more you limit device-specific code, the more flexible it'll be. And if you must have those pixels exactly where you wanted them, and you've designed everything to be exactly where you need it, and you do have device-specific code, you should have a nice, graceful failover. There's always the chance that someone else is going to run it. And if you fail when it isn't 720 by 720, your app's going to get bad ratings. It's going to look bad. It's going to make BlackBerry 10 look bad. That's not nice. That's not even polite. Got to get that thing working. Oh, yes, multiple icons and splash screens. In the descriptor, you're allowed to have apps splash screens for different sizes. So we'll choose the ones that are the best fit if you haven't set the explicit size. And otherwise, if you set the explicit size, we'll show that. So you can provide multiple icons for different form factors and different splash screens. And when different splash screen really makes sense is portrait versus landscape opening. If you only have one splash screen and it's landscape based, it looks weird when someone opens and the device is already in portrait and vice versa. So let's follow the user experience. See, this is kind of my own fault. The uh, powder in the gloves that I used at the start has stopped the touch screen from working very well with my hands, which is kind of silly. OK. Now, here is a photo viewing application. Over here, we can flow into our albums. We've got three albums. We can see Malmo, Asia, and the United States. Then we can go into an album. We can go into one photo and share that photo. Four taps. And look at all the features that are in there that the guys mentioned a little bit earlier. So here were tabs, the action bars, back bars, context menus overflowing. If you tried to fit share, edit, rotate, set as, and favorite down here, that could look horrible. You agree? Because in general, you don't want to always rotate. You don't want to always share. Well, maybe you do. You don't want to always set as your home screen or, or set as the reminder of when grandma calls. You don't always want to do that. We have published some user experience guidelines here. You can see those at that URL. Now, if you are writing an app and you notice that your user does sit as all the time, maybe this is a bad example, does favorite all the time, but never, ever, ever shares, that user is going to have a better experience when rotate is on that screen and share is on the overflow. You can programmatically control that. If you listen to what your user is telling you, you can make better design choices and learn to behave like that user wants you to. There are at least 26. <coughs> I think Alex said 24 before. At least 26 languages supported by BlackBerry 10. 
<coughs> wow, that was loud. Many users don't speak English. This is a really easy way to increase your audience. You should localize your metadata. And each SDK that we have has its own localization mechanism. I don't want to brag, but I speak like six of these. I can speak English, UK, English, Australia, English, US, English, Canada, English, New Zealand. Top that. <laughs> okay, application packaging. This is where you've already done your coding, you've built your UI, you're happy. Let's get the thing ready to test on a real device or in the simulator. Now, a lot of the packaging happens for you inside the tool set. This is more informational than it. Oh, you have to remember to do this. Now, what goes into an application is your bar, metadata, your files, and that gives you a bar. Bar stands for BlackBerry Archive. So Playbook, OS, and, a, and on, everything is in a bar. BlackBerry 7 and earlier, things were in CODs, and ALXs as well. So in here, you have the details, like which icon to use, which permissions I'm asking for, who wrote this? Yeah. Well, it was, this one's not mine. Yeah, this was a different one. All those things go into producing a bar. Here is an example of the type of stuff that is in that application metadata. The package name. Yeah, that makes sense. The application name, my sample. Hmm, interesting choice. The version, 1.00. The build ID, 47. The permissions you're requesting. So in a documentation, you can find a list of all the permissions you can request. Generally, it's a different type of service. Also, in your bar would go details of what type of invocation events you're going to want to receive. So if you are something that can share docs, or if you are something that can display doc files, this is where that information is going to go. The author is also in there and the platform version you want. And the platform version is significant because this is the minimum platform you would run on. If you don't run on Playbook 2, but you run on BlackBerry 10, this is where you'd say that. Here's an example of what a user would see depending on the permissions that you'd set up in your bar descriptor. So they're asking, can this person look at my files? What should your app do if they don't give you that permission? If you're not allowed to look at files, what should you do? Work anyway, without that file functionality, if it's possible. Sometimes it's not going to be possible. The user is being requested. Can this app have access to your microphone? Again they might not let you. So if you're making a VoIP app, not having access to the microphone is kind of a big deal. But you shouldn't crash. You should let them run, and they might want to test things. They might be using two BlackBerry 10 devices to build a very high-tech baby monitor. So one device is upstairs, one device is downstairs. They didn't give permission to the microphone because they never, ever want the baby to hear, even by accident. They don't want to wake it up. Paranoid parents with a spare BlackBerry 10 device to put in the kids' room as a microphone. Weird parents. <laughs> GPS location. The users may not want to give you that. And your app, even though the GPS component is useful, your app could still be very useful to them without you knowing that information. So make sure it still works. Camera, that's another one. <coughs> users may not want to give you access to the camera. Deal with it by gracefully failing. Don't crash. Don't say, this application refuses to run because we need your camera. Bad UI, UX, sorry. And device identifying information. Can this application know things like your PIN? 
Is that critical to you? Okay, you mentioned the application assets. We're going to be inside there. Now, what happens is you have a local path when you build. The example here is develop game assets, game XML. And that assets directory, when you're inside the bar, if you just open dot slash, that's going to be the work directory. So you can open the assets without navigating to some funny path. Now, for those of you who've already looked at a dev alpha or the simulator, you'll see that there is a real path like user account slash 1000 slash application name, very long with some hash appended after it. And then you shouldn't use that path because it could move at any time. It's non-standard. Just because you know what it is doesn't mean you should use it. Your work directory is going to be where your assets were. So use them. Uh, the assets are read-only. So once you have deployed your app, you cannot go in there and change the icons, change the images that were deployed with the app. Uh, you wouldn't expect to, but it's interesting to note for people who have ideas. Interesting to note. Uh, the bar descriptor is used for air and native code. So inside Momentix, inside the IDE for Cascades, it's very, very easy to build a bar descriptor. Inside Air, the tools are okay too. And that's mentioned here because Android, you don't have to work so much on building a bar descriptor. It's going to look inside your Android package and build one by itself. Okay, when you can package an app, there are two types. One, which is development which has many benefits. The other, which is release, which has other benefits. The development package is unsigned, and it will not run on any device except for one where you as a developer have sat there and installed a debug token. The debug token lasts about a month, and you can keep on putting them in as many times as you want. It gives you permission to run apps on that device without contacting RIM. Now, when you do sign, just like with Java, when you're signing, you have to hit our signing server and give the signature back. Well, no, just to verify, the signature is generated locally because it's private key based. Because you don't need to contact RIM to build a development package, you don't need to be online. You can be working at your cottage. You don't need to go and buy a 3G stick. You can keep on developing again and again, no matter where you are. You don't need to be connected. It allows debugging and tracing. So you can use GDB, which is part of the SDK, to sit there on the command line and do back traces and print variables. Or you can use the beautiful debugger built into Momentix, which I will talk about later this afternoon in the tooling section. It allows tracing, and it allows access to the application sandbox, which means when you are debugging, you can modify those assets. But if you expect to be able to modify them, when you have done a real release package, it's not going to work. Because you cannot modify them in a release package. Now, in the release, it is signed for publishing. Something very important about actually signing is you burn that version number. You have your package name, you have your author name, you have 10.0.6 build 47. Once you have told us that you have signed that version, you cannot use that version again. So if you're developing and you want to be debugging and you're doing a full sign, you've just added a lot of steps. You have to be connected and you have to keep on incrementing that version number. Debugging, more fun when you're debugging. Release, more fun when releasing. It is optimized. The command that the arguments that the compiler receives are going to be different so that the code is optimized and there's not going to be debug information in there. Assets in that sandbox are now going to be read-only. So you can't go in and tweak things. Hmm. Now, this slide should not come as a surprise to anybody because we already talked a lot about that. When it is on the device, you can only have one on there at a time. 
So if two developers were trying to debug on the one device, you could only have one person's token active at the same time. That token is generated from your code signing keys. So it does uniquely identify you. And generally, if you're doing a release and you're serious about this, you don't want every developer in the company to have the code signing keys. Because if they did and they left, they're you. They have that key. They can sign stuff as you. Something else to think about. Uh, I mentioned that it requires renewal. Lasts for 30 days. And it is not required for the simulator. You don't need anything, anything at all, security-wise, to start developing on that simulator. So you could hit developerblackberry.com, download the SDK, download the simulator, uh, hit vmware.com, download VMware Player, have everything set up, be running apps, and you've never told us who you are. You've never told us your email address so that we can send you back that code signing key. It should be painless, it should be easy. And hopefully, this debug token methodology is a step in the right direction. Monetization. Like I mentioned right at the start, everyone cares a little bit about money. So, question often asked is, what can I sell? What can't I sell? So you can sell digital content, like ebooks, magazines, photo artwork, digital properties. So you could be paying to see photos. You could be say, paying to see magazines. These are assets. Once someone has this, it means something to them because they now have that photo. They can now read that magazine. It's tangible in a visual form. Now, what can I sell? Virtual currencies. So if you want to have beefcake dollars, that's not going to get through Apple. Uh, additional functionality is something you can sell because you've written the app and you have new levels. That's a case of new functionality. So that functionality you can do through our payment service. Dynamic content like video streaming, voice, dis voice transcription, that's all stuff that you could do through charging. In-app credits, no, we don't allow that. I think the rationale is if you stop answering your support email and all these app credits have gone to waste, what happened to that money? You've, people have given you money for something. They didn't get anything. They got something that could turn into something one day. You can't sell physical goods or services. So you shouldn't be selling cameras in your app through BlackBerry Payment Service. And you shouldn't be selling digital goods that are used across multiple applications. So if you have three games and they all want to share the same new avatar, you can't sell that avatar for those three games. We also have the BlackBerry, oh, before I go on, sorry. Our payment services APIs, they have been blogged about, so you can read about those right now. The advertising ecosystem, the APIs for that are not there yet, so you cannot find out exactly how that's going to work. But if you read on the BB7 and earlier details, you'll probably be able to interpolate how it will be. So as it worked, or works right now on BB7 and earlier, there is, for one of the ways, is inside a Java application, you can have a banner control. So when you display that on your application, content will be displayed, and as a developer, you can get money. I imagine for BB10, it will be very similar, but as I said, those APIs aren't available yet. <coughs> application publishing. So once you have built your release, you have to do something with it. Now make sure when you do publish, you think about your distinct brand. Um, a few years ago when I was on singles websites, 
I would pretend I was a female looking for a male so that I could check out the competition. I recommend doing the same thing. Because if you're writing one of those 1400 solitaire apps and your icon looks like every single other one, are you going to be downloaded? No. Well, okay, there's a chance because you'll tell your mum to download a copy. Yeah, good for you. That doesn't really count. So it customizes your application's appearance. So put in there a name, description, icon, and splash screens so that everything about your app is visible. If you don't have splash screens up there in App World, your app might look sterile. It might look dry. It may look uninviting. And someone else will get the download. Not so good. Publishing to App World is the distribution mechanism. Well, that's not quite true. Is the majority distribution mechanism for BB10. So you have your release. You want grandma to install it? Well, grandma either needs to get a debug token and do some funky stuff like that, or get it through AppWorld. The, the other case is from Mobile Fusion. If you have an enterprise activated BlackBerry 10 device, and you say to that uh, enterprise space, uh, push my word viewer to everyone who works in my enterprise, then they'll be seeing it, but it's still visible to them through AppWorld. It's just not visible to everybody else. Now, you do need an AppWorld account in order to publish. And when you are going to publish, you need to provide these things. Your release. Now, if your release is not signed and you've sent AppWorld your debug bar, it's getting rejected. A detailed application description. That may or may not stop it from getting into AppWorld. But if the description is vague, if the description is meaningless, people aren't going to download it. A large product icon, so that when people are swiping through that cinematic experience, yours stands out. At least one screenshot. If you don't have any screenshots, people are going to be disinterested. So who here has thought, ooh, I need an app to do something, gone to an app store, had a look, and there's five. If there's one without screenshots, that has really good ratings, and one with a couple of screenshots that look like it does exactly what you want to do but has low ratings, what do you guys normally decide? I personally get the one with the screenshots because I know it looks like it can do what I want it to do, not that they got their friends to give them a positive rating. You also have to provide payment information. Is this a free app? Is it a paid app? Application upgrades are very common. People find bugs. People fix spelling mistakes. You decide to finally shell out and get a translator for English New Zealand. That happens. You have to use the same code signing keys forever. If you want to upgrade your app and you do not have the code, same code signing keys, we do not think it's you. You cannot replace that app without your code signing keys. So when Jim decides to resign, don't let him take the only copy from the server room. That would be bad, because then Jim is you. You could sue Jim, but from our point of view, he is you. Um, when you're upgrading, I mentioned that the assets, that the data stays the same. The assets are replaced. And because that data is still there, Make sure you can still read it. Your application, it's just crashing because you had a missing end quote in some text file that you were storing data in. Terrible. And then you're going to have to release another upgrade. So you should make sure that in your upgrade plans, you are testing stuff like this. You are testing for a user who has a huge amount of data because they've been an avid user of your app for years. They're going to be the most annoyed when it crashes after the upgrade because they already have all that data, and now they can't use it. <laughs> yes, that pretty much is summarized in the comment there. One star, you guys ate all my data. And that is time for a coffee break. And Shadid will be up after the break. Oh, no, and it's a five-minute coffee break. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>